I was born to a Tibetan father who was an ex-monk and a Mongolian mother who was actually a princess or royalty of the then known Xinjiang. Uh, now it's autonomous part of China. My father had a family in Tibet. He had a wife and he had children. And uh, he was scouting for a place to immigrate from Tibet to Taiwan. So he had gone to Taiwan to look for a place. And while he was there, he was there alone. He had left his wife and his children back in Tibet. While he was there, he met up with my mother. And I can say that an interest grew. Um, but my father never revealed to my mother about his family. So my mother was under the assumption that he is single. So they became quite close. And my mother became pregnant by him. And after becoming pregnant, she found out from him that he has a wife and he has another family. And um, she was very, very unhappy. She was very upset. And being the royal personage that she is, uh, the community, the Mongolian community, the Xinjiang community that was in uh, Taipei at the time, which is quite a few of them, and also in the US and also back in her homeland, Xinjiang, were very, would be very disappointed and they would be very um, criti critical of her being a young girl and uh, being pregnant and uh, not having been married. So she had to give birth to me in secret. So after she found out my father does have a family, she basically cut off all ties with him completely. And um, she never let him know what had happened to her or myself after she had cut off from him. She gave birth to me in Taiwan itself. And because of the stigma and the shame, that time, 46 years ago, she wasn't able to tell anyone that she had had a, a child, a son, that was myself. Uh, my grandmother, which was her mother, was very supportive and very loving. And I guess my grandmother took one look at me and kind of fell in love and kind of not looked at the way I was conceived, but more at myself. Because I remember my grandmother was very loving towards me. Uh, my mother was a different story. She was hurt. She was embarrassed. She was extremely humiliated. And I respect her feelings and I understand. Um, she gave me up for a family in Taiwan for adoption. And the family was paid about 50 US dollars a month to watch me and take care of me. Unfortunately, um, they didn't do a very good job because there was a lot of marks on my body of um, beatings and abuse. So my grandmother had flown to uh, Taiwan to take me out from this family. So after I was born, my mother and my grandmother all immigrated to the US. So hence, my grandmother came back to Taiwan to get me. And she had arranged another Mongolian adopted family in New Jersey, Howell, New Jersey. So at the age of seven, I was taken away from the first adopted family in Taiwan and went to the US um, and was given to the second adopted family. The second adopted family were Mongolians. And I became a naturalized citizen of the US. And I stayed with them for about eight, nine years till I was around 15. Um, from a very young age, I was drawn to anything Buddhist. Whether it was a Buddha image, whether it was a TV program on lamas in Tibet, or lama series in Tibet, or monasteries, or pictures of various Buddhas from around the world, whether it was Thailand or Cambodia or Jap Japanese or Chinese in encyclopedias and books. And I, I very much spent a lot of time in the school library looking up Buddhism and investigating Buddhism. And I used to Xerox a lot of pictures of various Buddhas and high lamas and post it up on my wall. And I very much wanted to become a monk. No one told me to be a monk. No one told me to become ordained. 
but I wanted to be. And I was excited to be. And being in an American neighborhood with American kids, nobody else there except for the local Mongolian community were Buddhists. Basically, I went to an American school. So what happened was people found me odd, not in a negative way, strange that such a young child would be drawn to Buddhism so strongly. And I remember being very young and wanting to always do chanting. And I was always engaged in meditation. And I was always somehow reading up on Buddhism and doing some kind of prayers. And I was drawn. And I used to pretend that I was a high lama giving teachings to an imaginary crowd. Where this came from, I don't know. How it came from, I don't know. But it was just inside of me. I mean, nobody put it in my head. It was just there, and it was very, very strong in me. So I told my parents, my step-parents in America, that I'm going to grow up, and I'm going to be a monk. And I'm not going to get married, and I'm not going to go to college and university, and I'm not going to pursue the American dream or materialistic dream, that I'm going to be a monk. And so they were very upset. They were very worried. They were very concerned. That's not what they adopted me for. They adopted me to be part of their family, to grow up to have a so-called normal American life, which I absolutely did not want. So a lot of tension happened between my parents and me because of this. And uh, at the age of 15, on my third attempt, I ran away. And I hitchhiked from Howell, New Jersey to California. And in California, to make a long story short, when we meet, when and if we meet, I can tell you more. But in California, I met up with a great Dharma teacher who introduced me to their Dharma teacher. And from there, I connected and was invited to the great Gandhian monastery in South India to study and to reside. Um, and I took the offer. So at the age of seven, I left Taiwan. At the age of, I left Taiwan for Howell, New Jersey. At the age of 15, I left Howell, New Jersey for Los Angeles. And from Los Angeles at the age of 22, 23, it was around my birthday time, I left for India. And uh, I have not traveled back to the United States since. And I'm 46 now. I've stayed in India in the monastery, and I was very happy there. Very, very at home. Very comfortable. Extremely happy. At peace. And I felt I belonged there. So after a few years in the monastery, I was recognized as a reincarnation of a deceased Lama, who was the abbot of the monastery. Um, so my predecessor was the abbot of the monastery that I had belonged to. And the very teachers that I was attracted to as a child were the teachers of my previous life, I was told. The pictures that I had kept on my shrine in New Jersey, in California, were the very pictures that were my teachers, I was told, in my previous life. That was a little pleasantly haunting to me because I was attracted to these teachers and the practice, but I didn't know why. So when I was in the monastery, being one of the few, at that time, English-speaking uh, monks, I was requested to go abroad to teach. So I traveled in Asia to teach at the request of the heads of the monastery. So from traveling, going back to the monastery, traveling, going back to the monastery many, many times, I was requested to stay in Malaysia. And that's what I have done. Being in Malaysia is not so different than being in America. I mean, people are the same everywhere. Everybody wants to you know, um, have a good education, get a good job, maybe become famous, make money have material benefits. And the struggle is always like this, where in developing countries, people are using all the energies to try to get ahead materially. 
where in countries that are so-called materially advanced, when they have everything, people try to go back to simplicity and find something that makes their mind at peace and happy. So in the developing world, people are looking for peace and happiness or some kind of answers or some kind of relief from physical difficulties, material difficulties by acquiring wealth. Whereas in countries where many people have wealth, those people go back to simplicity and they try to look for something that gives them happiness. And this kind of struggle goes on and on and on, back and forth, and everywhere I visit. It's not meant as criticism, but it's, it's just my observation. And I, through the years when I have taught and explained how our mind works, how our desires work, how our anger works, and how our wrong projections and wrong understanding and misunderstanding of the world around us actually makes us, makes us more thirsty, makes us more in want, more dissatisfied than satisfied. That our, our wrong projections, our wrong thinking, our wrong perceptions make us want more of actually what's not good for us and want less or attain less of actually what is good for us. And because of habituations, this cycle goes on and on and on, creating tremendous amount of unhappiness in our minds. And when we are unhappy, we make the people around us unhappy. And then they in turn make us unhappy, we make them unhappy, and we just go on through life like that until our death. Buddhism is a great religion, like many other religions. Buddhism doesn't have all the answers for everyone. And it may not be suitable for everyone. And that's okay. Buddhism not being suitable for everyone doesn't mean that people who it doesn't suit are wrong, or that Buddhism is not complete. It's just a matter of affinity and needs. So, Buddhism does have the answer for many of the dilemmas and many of the self-created problems that we go through. And if we realize that our problems are self-created, that's the first step towards an answer, a progress, a result. Buddhism does believe in higher beings, enlightened beings, awakened beings, beings that can bless us, help us, avert difficulties, and even direct us on the right path. But Buddhism doesn't believe that salvation are within those beings. Buddhism believes that salvation is within us to become those beings who are enlightened. That gets to what I want to tell you, is that I would like to create a institution. Not another temple, not another place for people to come and offer incense and you know, do some meditation courses and feel good and just go away, but something that suits the modern people. I would like to start an institution that has yoga, that has qigong, that has Chinese traditional medicine, that has flower arranging, that has art, that has vegetarian cooking, that has Buddhist philosophy, that has philosophy, I would like to have that kind of institution somewhere in Asia where we can invite elite monks and teachers to come to this place and to give talks, give programs, give, give lectures and have set themes or set courses for people to learn to improve. Because as Asia starts to become more and more materially advanced, more Asians everyone will start to look deeper inside to say what else is there in life. And I think having this kind of institution would help very much. I have 13 departments in our organization of which some is doing artwork, some is doing tailoring, some is doing traditional pujas, some are feeding the homeless, some are promoting vegetarianism. We have many di different departments because I feel Buddhism isn't just meditating. I feel, I feel meditation is important, but it isn't just meditating. 
So that, that's what I want to achieve with my life, is I want to create an institution that isn't just praying, but a place where it educates people to think higher, to think bigger, to think out of the box, to think more. Not necessarily they enter our institution and leave a Buddhist, but they enter our institution, join our institution, and leave it or be a part of it or be involved with it and, and become a person that thinks wider, more of the environment, of animals, of people, of, of others' welfare, to stop thinking of themselves so much as much as they start to be concerned for others. And I think an institution rooted in Buddhism would be very, very helpful, not necessarily making people Buddhists. Now, I have a few eminent teachers who are very famous in Tibet and who have given me many predictions over the years that has proven true. One of my teachers who have given me many predictions that over time have proven very true, it is a result of his power of his meditations. And he told me that I should write a book and I should let people know about my life and my struggles and I, what I went through and the difficulties I went through and how I became a monk and why I became a monk why I left the West to go to the East, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And he says that it would inspire many people out there. It would, it would nurture, inspire, give hope, give direction, and maybe give ideas to many people out there. And I, I politely said to my teacher that my life is not worth talking about. I didn't do much. And I, I don't really like to talk about my life because I don't feel I've done much. But my teacher insisted. He says, you should write books. You should have your people write books definitely about your life and being that it was a consistent instruction from my teacher from my teacher for over a few years which meant that over the years I met him again and again he would tell me the same thing over and over so in order not to tire him out I agreed I agreed so my people have traveled to Xinjiang my students and friends have traveled to Xinjiang to Tibet to, to America they have traveled to Taiwan to research my background to interview my relatives and friends and people who grew up with me and came up with a very comprehensive with comprehensive information about my background and where I came from. So I was also instructed by one of my teachers or blessed by one of my teachers to do a movie of myself. Now to all you very special people who are watching this video, how egotistical how big-headed of me to think that I should make a movie of myself and tell the world. Well, let me, make, let, let me make it very politely clear with all of you. It's not my idea. It's not myself who is actually interested in this. I am actually carrying out the instructions of my teacher. And uh, most of the time I have, and um, they asked me to do this. What I told you just now is just a short synopsis of who I am or what happened to me. But when and if we meet, I can tell you a lot more. I can explain a lot more. And I guess for me, what I want to explain is not that I'm a, a Rinpoche in my previous life, is, a re is a, this High Lama and I'm the reincarnation it's of this person, this personage, and uh, I've got knowledge and I'm, I'm some kind of teacher that's not what I'm very much interested in. What I was interested in was the human story, that the struggles I went through, the pain, difficulties, and how much I had to push to live the dream I have. That it was not an easy journey. It was a very difficult journey most of the time. And some of the things that I will relate to people, to you, to the film, to the book, to the world, can be shocking. You wouldn't think these things happened to a Buddhist monk or prior. You wouldn't think that these kind of things would happen to a person. But I have a lot of shocking stories, happy stories, boring stories, interesting stories, that I thought that if I share with the world, perhaps I can help a person. Perhaps I can change a person's life. 
perhaps I can make a difference in a person's life. And if I can do that, all of this would be worth it. My life would be worth it. I live my life for others. For the rest of my life, I will be a Buddhist monk. And I will teach the Dharma. And I will create social action, social awareness. For the rest of my life, I will concentrate on creating a great Buddhist institution. Where there's learning, there's study, there's practice, there's a creation of awareness. A temple, an institution that has not been seen in the world. You see, because a lot of Easterners and Westerners cannot go to Tibet and learn Buddhism the traditional way. It's too harsh, it's too severe, it's not wrong, it's too difficult. And a lot of the Tibetan Lamas would find it difficult to remain and teach outside of Tibet in a traditional manner. So I thought to merge something of the old and the new so that Buddhism can take on a new facelift. Buddhism can take on a new renaissance, a new type of direction where it can appeal in its power of spirituality to lift people from their predicaments and give them hope, direction, knowledge, and wisdom. Something that makes their life worth living, more than they could ever imagine. At the same time, I would like to leave a legacy behind of a place where it educates people, not on a political level, on a spiritual level, to give something back to society in that kind of manner. So, doing the movie would help perhaps other people who are on a spiritual journey to continue, and more, the movie can bring awareness to the project that I would like to do, which is to create this, this kind of institution. So I would like to appeal to many special people out there who think similar along the lines that you would like to do more with your life. You would like to do something much more with your life. And help me to accomplish this. I'm going to make this tape short and sweet. So I'm going to end it here. The purpose of the movie is not to make me a superstar. I'm not interested in that anymore. The purpose of this movie is to create awareness of spirituality in the modern world, in the materialistic world, that it still has a place. Spirituality has a place in the modern world. And it takes people like you and me to bring that message across. Spiritual practices and spiritual values has a place in the modern world. And it's not only it has a place, it is necessary. That's the message. The second part of the message is I would like to create a beautiful institution that I call Kichara, Kichara World Peace Center, where it will be an institution of learning for modern people to think, act, function, learn in accordance with spiritual values. And if my film can bring a lot of benefit to people and inspire them, then I'll be most humbled. I'll be most happy. A simple, ordinary person like me and the struggles that I went through and the difficulties I went through can inspire and change someone's life, it would be extremely humbling and gratifying. So I hope in the future we can all work together. We can speak, we can talk, we can meet to do something. Thank you very much. I wish you happiness, peace, and spiritual awakening. Thank you. On the 24th of October, 1965, a descendant of Genghis Khan, the Mongolian princess Dewa Nimbo, gave birth to an illegitimate child in Taiwan. Unbeknown to the princess, the father of the child was already married, which brought shame to this princess and caused her child to be cut off from his royal title of Prince Iska Min. 
At seven months old, several monks came and recognized the child as a reincarnated Lama. They requested to take the child to the monastery to continue his previous life's work. However, afraid that the names of his parents would be announced during the ordination ceremony, the princess rejected this great recognition. She said, if he was really a High Lama, he would eventually find his own way to the monastery. Soon after, his mother decided to give him up to an adopted family. Because of his strong nature, he was given the nickname Xiao Niu, which means little bull in Mandarin. Throughout his childhood, he was ill-treated and ill-fed by his foster mother and teased mercilessly by his stepbrothers. His meals usually consisted of plain rice and sugar, and as a result, the child with a mouthful of decayed teeth was neglected and malnutritioned. Xiao Niu, who was often hungry, would wander around the streets to look for something to eat. When he went home, he was often punished without reason and forced to kneel on rice, which was very painful. It was not a pleasant childhood, yet he was a happy child. Later, his grandmother, Queen Dechen Min, brought Xiao Niu from Taiwan to Howell, New Jersey, in the United States. She handed the child to a Kalmyk Mongolian couple, Dana and Boris Bugayev, who became his foster parents and named him Bircher Bugayev. The six year old Xiao Niu now had a strange name, stayed in a strange country, and could not understand a strange language. Although everything seemed confusing at first, he was showered with toys and love from his foster parents. It was in New Jersey that young Bircher found his strong attraction to Buddhism. He recited the mantra, O Mani Peme Hong, naturally. Coincidentally, Rashi Jempa Ling, the first Tibetan Buddhist center in America, is located only 10 minutes away from Bircher's house. This became his favorite place to visit, much to the disappointment of the Bugayevs. Mr. and Mrs. Bugayev had high hopes for Bircher. They hoped that their lovely son would grow up to have a wonderful job, a family, and to live happily ever after, according to their point of view. Bircher's strong inclination to the Buddhist teachings meant that he could be a monk in the future, and this possibility threatened the hopes of the Bugayevs. However, Bircher was dedicated to learning about Buddhism, and this also became the commitment of a lifetime. His foster parents started to hate the Dharma Center, and any connection between Bircher and Buddhism triggered an irrational anger in them. Eventually, they forbade Bircher from going to the Dharma Center. The foster parents filled Bircher's time with heavy household chores. The young boy was responsible for cleaning the huge house which sat on an acre of land. This included cleaning all the floors in the house, doing the laundry, helping with cooking, washing the dishes and raking the yard. After school, Bircher was expected to clean the entire house from top to bottom. If he missed a spot or didn't do the housework well, he would be severely beaten. Later, the punishments were intensified and his foster mother often abused him physically and mentally. He would be beaten up without reason and Dana would even put him on the floor, step on his back to keep him in place and beat the lower half of his body with a broomstick. Often she would beat him until the broom was broken. Then she would continue with another broom. His whole body would be full of bruises. In addition to the physical abuse, Bircher also suffered psychological abuse. Dana would go into his room in the middle of the night. She would also tell him that she would kill him by stabbing a knife to his heart when he was asleep. As a result, Bircher always slept lightly and with fear in his heart. Behind this American dream, was a life of fear and pain. It was only later that Dana was diagnosed with schizophrenia, which explained her sudden volatile and violent nature. Although she had brutally punished Bircher when she lost control, Bircher always remembered Dana as being very kind and loving. Bircher never blamed Dana for the abuse he received from her because he had somehow known that she was not well.
As Bircher became older, Boris and Dana continued to stop Bircher from going to the Dharma Center. They started to slander and defame his guru. To protect the Dharma Center and his beloved guru, Bircher made several attempts to commit suicide and run away. On one of his runaway attempts, he was brutally raped at gunpoint. He managed to escape, but was caught by the police and sent back home to increased screamings and beatings. Finally, one day, at the age of 15, Bircher stepped out of his home in New Jersey with two bags and $50 in his pocket. Alone and with nobody to rely on, he hitchhiked from New Jersey to Los Angeles, passing through different cities and sleeping on the streets along the way. In glittering LA, Bircher found another Dharma center, Thupten Daugeling, which let him practice Dharma freely. He achieved his diploma, which allowed him to leave school and work, and he held three jobs to support himself while living and helping out in the Dharma Center. Like all teenagers, Bircher also enjoyed a good social life. During the weekends, he loved to dress up and go partying. At six foot two, with exotic good looks, Bircher always drew people's attention. He even attracted the talent agents of Hollywood, and he was approached by Paramount for opportunities in the movie industry. He was even approached to do porn. At that time, there was a high lama from Ganden Shatze Monastery, His Holiness Kyabje Zong Rinpoche, who was invited to teach at Thupden Dageling. Meeting His Holiness was the most important turning point of Bircher's life. Bircher became Zong Rinpoche's personal assistant, and in the short period of six months, Bircher gave all he could, serving Zong Rinpoche and taking care of the Dharma Center happily, which represented his strong devotion to his guru. Zong Rinpoche was the first to reveal to Bircher that he was a Turku, which means a highly respected reincarnation of a High Lama. This finally made sense of Bircher's overwhelming attraction to the Dharma. At that time, Bircher was at a crossroads in his life. He asked Zong Rinpoche whether he should be an actor or a monk. Zong Rinpoche told him that he would be very famous as an actor, but if he became a monk, he would benefit more sentient beings. Upon hearing this, Bircher folded his hands immediately and requested to be ordained. That evening, Zong Rinpoche cut Bircher's hair to represent his intention to be a monk and his farewell to the colorful future of a Hollywood career. This encounter with Zong Rinpoche thus wrote a new chapter for Bircher's extraordinary life, realizing the purpose of his life, which was to benefit all sentient beings. Zong Rinpoche then left America to go back to India, and young Bircher began to prepare to travel to India to be a monk. However, one day, he received a call while he was at work and was told that Zong Rinpoche had passed into clear light. He was completely devastated and couldn't believe the news. Over the next few weeks, he was torn whether to continue to go to India or to stay in America to be an actor. At the back of his mind was his promise to Zong Rinpoche to become a monk. He told himself that he must keep this promise. If not, he would waste all the kindness and compassion that was shown to him by Zong Rinpoche. Although his foster parents had threatened Bircher that once he wears the monk's robes, he would be disowned, Bircher realized truly in his heart that he must keep his promise to Zong Rinpoche and live out the destiny with which he was born. After saving enough money for his travel, Bircher finally left for India to begin a new chapter of his life. After all these experiences in his life, just as Princess Dewa Nimbo, Bircher's birth mother, had said, if he was really a High Lama, he would eventually find his own way to the monastery. From Prince Iska Min to Xiaonyu to Bircher Bugayev, after traveling halfway around the world, he had finally found his way back home. His Eminence, Tem Tuku Rinpoche, was recognized as the incarnation of a High Lama, a Rinpoche, in 1991. As he ascended the throne, 
he thought, I'm going to sit on this throne with the motivation that I will benefit others and focused on why he was becoming a Rinpoche.